Hi, welcome back to the Global Networking Show. We're sorry we had a break last uh, month due to some scheduling difficulties, uh, but we're back and with a fantastic show this month. So uh, I'm Andy Lapata, I'm your co-presenter, and I'm joined from Paris by Dr. Ivan Meisner. Hi, Andy. Uh, in this show, we're going to focus on one of the most important skills in modern business, being able to craft and deliver an effective message that is so important and one that people, I think, uh, can understand and act upon. And our guests today are absolute experts in helping business people to communicate that message in ways that people will remember. We've got Sam Horn, the intrigue expert, who's joined us, and you're probably already intrigued by that. Uh, it's the first time I've had the chance to meet Sam, but I've been aware of her for a number of years through uh, the National Speakers Association in the States, where she has a fantastic reputation. She's been the, the author of very successful books, most notably Hop Tong Tung Fu, see I can't even say that, Sam, and Concentrate. Um, and then from the UK, an old friend of mine, Andy Bounds. Uh, Andy wrote the fantastic book, The Jelly Effect, and its follow-up, The Snowball Effect. Um, and, and you know, talking about communication and making your message stick, Andy got his insight from the fact that his mother is blind, and that's given him a lifetime's experience of understanding how to communicate from someone else's point of view. And that's absolutely critical when you're persuading others. So we've got, I think, two fantastic guests and a very interesting show on the way. And we've also been joined by Inga Bexley, who will be letting us know if you have any questions from our guests. Yes, and if you are watching us live, please send in your questions um, uh, either to um, Google Hangout or you can tweet us using hashtag uh, GNAT show and I will try our best to feed your questions uh, during the show and we will answer them. Thank you Inga. Sam, Sam it is great to have you on the show. I love your material, love hearing you speak. Um, it's great to have you on the show today. Thanks for being here. You've heard in public life uh, who communicates the message in the most effective way. What can you learn from people who communicate their message effectively? Uh, Ivan, I, I'm sorry, I really couldn't hear your question. Can you try that one more time, please? Yeah, I think we're getting feedback from my Andy uh, Bounds. Andy, you might want to mute your mic. Uh, I said, Sam, you've heard uh, in people in public life who communicate their message in really effective ways. What can we learn from people who communicate their message in an effective way? <laughs> okay, 60 seconds, rock and roll, Ivan. It's that if we want to communicate with people in a way that connect, We've got to do one thing, and you know what? We've got to get their eyebrows up. <laughs> because if I try and explain my business or my idea or my priority project, and try it right now, Ivan, and your idea, your eyebrows are like knit and fro. See, you're confused, right? Confused people don't say yes. You know, and if you're just sitting there and your eyebrows are unmoved, it means you're unmoved or you've had Botox, which I don't think you've had, Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> now raise your eyebrows. Ah, see it's like you're intrigued, it's like you want to know more. That means I got my idea in your mental door. So the first thing is to make sure that we introduce our idea in a way people are intrigued, their eyebrows are up, they want to know more. I love your eyebrow test uh, concept, uh, Sam. I've shared it with many people. I love the concept a lot. Great. Andy, can I ask you then, I, I mean, you, you talk a lot, we've talked about seeing things from other people's perspective already when I introduced you. Uh, Sam said about you've got to get people's eyebrows to raise up and get their interest. It's one thing to say that. How do you do that? How, what, what would you say to people to say, well, okay, here's how you can get them to raise their eyebrows, to be intrigued, to want to know more? Okay, Andy, the main thing to remember is almost definitely people aren't interested in you which sounds quite strange, but what happens is how many times do you see people when they do a sales presentation and they begin it with, we were founded in 1922, here's the map of our offices, or if you go to a networking function and you say to somebody, so what do you do? And they say, well, I am a CPA or I am a lawyer. And all the time what people are doing is they're focusing on the two things that people don't care about. Number one, they're talking about themselves, not other people. And number two, they're talking about what they do rather than what they cause. So I've never wanted to speak to a CPA 
but I have wanted to speak to someone who could help other people pay less tax. I've never wanted to speak to a lawyer, but I have wanted to be, speak to people who could help me buy the house of my dreams or keep me out of jail. So the thing, that's, that's a joke, obviously. Um, so the thing we look for is what I call the afters. In other words, why will the other person be better off after talking to us? What's the value we can bring rather than what it is that we do? I, 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 your example of how people start off their presentations, I use a lot because we, I, you've probably heard this phrase. I don't know if it's a very British one, but weeing all over the place. You know, we were founded then. We're based here. We have this many staff. And as you say, people just aren't interested. They don't care. Uh, and when I used to run networking groups, you would hear people stand up and ask for referrals. And Ivan, you've probably heard this in, in BNI chapters across the world where they say, I want to talk to this person, I want to refer to this person, and I want to talk to them because I want to do this for them, and I want to do that for them. And the bottom line is that person doesn't care about you at all. So how do you change, how do you work out what other people care about? Okay. Call on me, call on me. <laughs> Man, how do you how do you work out what other people care about? <laughs> I can tell you care about that. <laughs> you know, it's uh, okay, we all know that people uh, have shorter attention spans than goldfish, right? The U.S. Center for Biotechnology Information said goldfish are coming in at nine seconds. We're coming in at eight seconds. So how do we get eyebrows up? And here's a quick example that shows us. I had a client with Springboard Enterprises, and Springboard has helped people get $6.2 billion in funding. And she said, Sam, I got good news and I got bad news. I said, what's the good news? She said, I'm going to be speaking at the Paley Center in front of a room full of investors. And I said, that is good news. I said, what's the bad news? She said, I'm going at 2.30 in the afternoon. And she said, I only have 10 minutes. She said, you can't say anything in 10 minutes. She said, how can I talk about my clinical trials, my business model, my financial model? I said, Kathleen, you don't have 10 minutes. You're going at 2.30. You've got less than 60 seconds to get eyebrows up. And she said, Sam, that's impossible. Here's the opening that not only helped her get eyebrows up, she was selected as Business Week's most promising social entrepreneur of 2010, and she also got millions in funding. So here's the opening. Did you know there are 1.8 billion vaccinations given every year? Did you know up to half of those are given with reused needles? Did you know we're spreading and perpetuating the very diseases we're trying to prevent? Imagine if there were a painless one-use needle for a fraction of the current cost. You don't have to imagine it. We've provided it. It's called PharmaJet, and she's off and running. Now, that's a replicable model of three did-you-know questions, imagine, and then you don't have to imagine, and bingo, in 60 seconds, you've won buy-in for what you care about. It, it, it's a, it's a, the old adage that, you know, people people buy. Let's, let's For this purpose, let's say people are interested because you solve a problem for them, isn't it? And, and you know, one of the key things I teach is you have to paint their problem. You know, unless you, you're one of the, the, the proportion of the, the, the business population that actually service needs and desires rather than, than challenges. But that's where you get people's attention is you can do something for them. Uh, and, and that's a, a classic example there. And Andy, you're so right. Another thing we're doing is we're not telling them. You know, we're not starting off with declarations, which forces people to be in the passive. You know, they're al we're almost holding them hostage. You sit and listen while I talk. By asking a question and introducing startlingly relevant information that we're sourcing. Did you know that Wall Street Journal said? Did you know that the Financial Times said? People are going, I didn't know that. They're already engaged and they're smarter than they were 15 seconds before. So we have just earned their attention in less than 60 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of um, research, isn't there, about the importance of what the word they use is challenging customers. And by challenging, it means provoking their thoughts, you know, teaching them things they didn't know. And a very powerful technique when you're speaking with someone in any walk of life is that you say something such that they look at you and say, well, I never knew that. You know, I never knew that. That is useful. 
And so the did you know times three, then the imagine is a great way to do it. Or, you know, simply ringing up someone's customers and saying, you know, I spoke to a couple of your customers and they say you're great at X, Y, Z, but did you know a couple of them are reporting back there? Anything at all which gets somebody to say, I did not know that, means straight away they see you as a value-bringing thing. And the minute people start seeing you as a value-bringing thing, they want to listen to you more. Their eyebrows are up, to use your word, Sam, because there's no, there's more value to come. Do you uh, have a question from the audience? Yes, um, there is a question from Mike Fountain, and he says, with video, YouTube becoming more relevant in today's communication mix, what's the best way to get your message to stick using this medium? Okay, I've, I've got an idea about, oh, Ivan, go ahead. No, no, go. you go ahead, Sam, and then uh, Andy, uh, I, I muted you again, Andy. I'll <laughs> unmute you when you're ready. Okay. It's uh, so, and and this is Michael uh, who uh, submitted this question, right, Inga? Mike. Mike, thank you. Okay, Mike, a great way, you know, video is a visual medium. Here is an example of how you can make your video, your visual medium, stick. I was uh, judging what's called a dolphin tank, which is the kinder, more gentler version of the shark tank. And there was a woman I was reviewing her pitch in advance. And she was trying to get funding for a hook you put in your car, you hang your purse on. And I'm thinking, really? You're trying to get funding for a hook you put in your car? But guess what she did? She started off and she said, have you ever been driving along and you had to stop all of a sudden and your purse fell off the passenger seat and your cell phone went underneath and your lipstick and you're driving and you're trying to get under the Imagine never having to do that again. Imagine always knowing a guy in the audience stood up and he said, I'll take two, one for my wife and one for my daughter. And I thought, she went from really? to I'll take two in 60 seconds because she started with Zeitgeist questions, which is, have you ever, da 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 oh yeah, I've been there, have you ever, da 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 oh man, that just happened to me yesterday. We had a connection, a visual connection, we put people in the scene, posed a problem where they wish they had our product or our service, and once again, it was acted out so they're visually engaged, all done in less than 60 seconds. Well, I hate when my purse falls off the per uh, off the. Uh, <laughs> uh, for, for our friends from uh, the UK, a Shark Tank is the equivalent to uh, Dragon's Den, which uh, started there. Love that show, by the way. Uh, uh, on on the um, uh, the example you used, uh, and going back to Mike's question, Sam, you know, obviously one of the things she could do is visually demonstrate exactly what the problem is. Um, by having a video as part of that pitch. Um, but also I think that YouTube plays a huge role in getting people to know you and understand your message through regular contact. You know, things like this show, you know, they get to know Ivan and I regularly as well as our guests when, you know, various guests every month, but they get to know us because it's a relaxed conversation. It's not a formal blog or anything along those lines. It's far more relaxed than that, so they get to know us a bit better. Um, I've started putting up networking tips from the top of a mountain in Siberia, from the deck of a boat last week, um, uh, a cruise ship in, in the English Channel. Um, and it's just different scenarios that get to see you as the person. And I think that that personality coming through, um, that you can use using the visual medium that, that YouTube or Vimeo or any of the other reputable sites out there offer, um, they can add for you, which you know you can't just do in words. Andy, what would your thoughts be on this? Um, uh, well, I agree with every regularity of contacts is important. The, the eyebrow raising, wow stuff, teaching people stuff, it's all good. The other thing to remember is what you want the YouTube video to cause. So there are some sales where you're not actually going to make the sale by somebody watching the video and going, I'll take two, as the, as the, um, the purse hook example showed. Sometimes it's a very complicated sale. So you're never going to get somebody saying, I'll take two at the end of it. The best you can hope for is they get in touch. 
So it's very important, you know, what is the action I'm looking for my video to cause here? Do I want people to get in touch? In which case, I, let, I make it easy for them to get in touch. Do I want them to buy something? If I do, I need to give them a couple of options at the end as to how they move forward. And so it's not the sexiest answer. I mean, the sexiest answer is to be interesting and teach them stuff and be enabling and all these wonderful things. But actually, unless the audience knows what you want them to do when they've heard it and you enable them to do that, then the best message just gets lost because people don't want to know what to do with it. I think it's can I pick up on something there? Uh, we've got, we've in the the, if I can just say, I think it's consistency in the use of something like YouTube. Um, I have been doing a video blog. Well, you need to mute yourself, mute yourself again, Andy. Um, I've been doing a video blog with YouTube uh, in my blog uh, every week, every Thursday for the last three years. And that consistency with a message, by the way, Sam, before we went live, you said I should do a blog here. I forgot. I did a video blog uh, this week. They got posted this morning uh, with, the, with the Eiffel Tower on the background. I'm, uh, I'm doing this from Paris. And um, my message uh, this week was about doing what you love. And I think if you can educate people in your YouTube messages, and you can do it consistently, you start to get a draw of people who want to follow your message. They want to hear what you have to say. And the more you can build that following, the more word of mouth is built and the more it grows. That's my two cents. You know, may I add something, Andy? Please, please do. Good. It's, uh, and everything, I, I really agree with everything that everyone's saying. And there's another thing that will make our videos get traction, get forwarded, uh, get uh, more views, scale, the visibility, etc. Uh, was the movie Pretty Woman very popular in England by any chance? Just a little bit. Just a little bit, okay. Well, Gary Marshall was the director of that movie, and he said something at Maui Writers Conference that was so profound, I remember it as if he said it this morning. He said, Hollywood directors can predict when their movies will make money based on one thing, and guess what it is? Do people walk out of the theater repeating something they heard word for word? Because see, if they're saying "Make my day," "I'll be back," you know, you make they're repeat. They, people are saying, "Seen any good movies?" And they're talking about your movie. They become a brand ambassador. And one of the best examples of that is Neil Gaiman, because Neil Gaiman, he's a good author, but he wasn't very well known globally until he gave a talk. At the, at the University of the Arts in Pennsylvania. There are only a couple hundred people in the audience. But he came up with a soundbite that ended up being a best-selling book that took that video viral in days. And here's the 30-second story. When his book, Sandman, came out, the best-selling author, Stephen King, got in touch. And he said, this is a brilliant book. You're going to have an incredible w career. I have three words of advice for you. Enjoy the ride. And Neil Gaiman said, I promptly went out and ignored that advice for 17 years, you know. And I got wrapped around the axle about my publisher and I got angry with the reviewers. And then I finally thought, what can I control? What can I control? Make good art. Make good art. Boom. That video went viral because it had a repeatable soundbite. Because if people can't repeat it, they didn't get it. And if they didn't get it, we're out of sight, out of mind. And it's interesting, I think, um, I, I want to go back to something Andy said in a second, but before I do, if I think about my talks and presentations and videos, there are a lot of phrases that I use that I repeat time and time and time again. And I see those repeated elsewhere and I see them tweeted back. You know, you look at my tweets, you can see what's retweeted. So I think that's very powerful and using those in your videos would be key. So that soundbite, I think, is a really, really strong piece of advice. Uh, the repeatable soundbite, the one that makes your day. Um, uh, Andy, I want to pick up on something that you said. And then Ivan came in and, and um, preempted what I had to say a bit as well. Because you talked about... Um, always give your viewers a call to action. What do you want them to do? And Ivan was talking about giving them regular content so you build a following. So Andy, I'd like to ask your advice uh, and your perspective on the modern phenomenon that is the freemium model. And the freemium model being the idea that we give lots of content for free. There is no 
point of action, here's advice, here's some ideas to take away, this will help you. In the process, you build a following, some of whom would then go on and buy from you uh, further down the route. Um, so we're all giving our time for free, you know, for, for 45 minutes, a wealth of information that hopefully will be helpful to the people who watch this show. Um, there's no call to action at the end, there's no request for a sale or a purchase, no one pitches their books or products on there. Um, it's purely here's some information for you. How does that sit with what you said and, and how can you get the balance right I think is the key. Yeah, great point. Um, you should never, in my experience, do something where people can say, you know, you know, the sort of smarmy salesperson who said the first one was free, but the next one costs. It's not that. It's 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 the abundance mentality of giving. What I mean by the call to action is, if there is something that you want them to do as a result, or you think they might want to do as a result, you have to enable them to do this. And somebody um, told me this very soon when I started my conference speaking career. Um, I've always hated being one of these smarmy sales on, on the stage, you know, and if you've enjoyed my talk, go and buy my book at the back of the room. I hate stuff like that. Um, but then someone said to me, the thing is, though, Andy, when somebody listens to you, they might want to find out more of your stuff. You know, they might want to read a bit more up on it. You talked about afters. They might want to read about that, or they might want to hear from you every week, or they might want to. So you not saying where they can go for more stuff, you're actually stopping them learning because you feel awkward letting them know. So all I mean by the call to action is not, right, you've heard this, now go and buy that. It's almost like if you found that useful and you want more, then here's a website for you. Or just as you do with this show, you know, we've all tweeted about it, we've all let people know about it, no doubt you'll let people know when the next one is so people can put it in the diary. So all I'm saying is give free stuff, but let someone know if they want more, where they can go. I've seen for instance, many brochures which are superb pieces of work, but it doesn't have a contact number on at the end. So even if people loved it, they go, well, that's great. How do I get in touch? I can't find out, so I'm not doing it. So I'm not saying give free stuff so you can sell. What I'm saying is give free stuff, but then enable people to get in contact if they want to. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. And just so that people know, if they go to globalnetworkingshow.com, they will get your details and they'll have Sam's details so they can follow up as well as we'll put it on the YouTube uh, video uh, of this show as well afterwards. Uh, Inga, I think we have another question. So thanks Mike for that question because it uh, triggered a lot of discussion which is exactly what we want. So Inga has another question for us. Yes, uh, and thanks for keeping me busy. So keep sending your questions and comments and you can do it either in Google uh, Hangouts or YouTube or uh, you can tweet. And the ne uh, next question is from Jeremy, and he asks, um, apart from asking a question, as we have just heard from Sam, it refers to the beginning of the talk, what other techniques would you recommend? Sam, you need to unmute your mic. Thank you. Uh, here's one of my best techniques, and it came from a very surprising source. Um, I, I bet we all agree we try not to get insular. So I always go to new conferences every year where I don't know anyone there. And uh, Saul Kaplan and his team run a great conference up in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. It's called BIF, Business Innovation Factory. So here was Tony Shea, head of Zappos. Here is um, Alan Weber, Fast Company. And yet of all of these top innovators from around the world, do you know who was most impressive? It was the person who came out she waited until the room was quiet and she leaned into the group and kind of with a twinkle in her eye she said I know what you're thinking what's a 13 year old got to teach me about innovation she said we 13 year olds know a thing or two like how to flip our hair but then little Cassandra Lynn 13 years old what she did is she read the mind of the audience she anticipated their objections or their resistance which is like who is this? Why should I listen? And she addressed and neutralized their resistance once again in the first 30 seconds by voicing it. So I think it's another great way to get attention is to ask ourselves, why would people say no? Why would they say this costs too much? I don't have time. I, I tried this before. It didn't work. And how can we say it first so that at least they choose to give us a chance instead of sitting there with their mental arms crossed just waiting for us to stop talking so they can tell us no? 
Great, great example. And Andy, how about how about you? What advice would you give? Yeah, I love that one. Um, yeah, they say, don't they, with objections, there's only three things that can happen with them. Either you mention them, like this 13-year-old brilliantly did, or the customer mentions them, or nobody mentions them. And there's plenty of people who think, thank goodness nobody mentioned it, <laughs> but then it means it hasn't gone away. And if you wait for someone else to mention it, well, they might not, or they mention it in a horrible way. So you raising it first, that's a great point. So I totally endorse that one. Um, another one which works very well is if you say the word only and a small number, then what you can do there is you can split a very complicated thing up. So I might say to a group of salespeople, the wonderful thing about sales is there are only three things you have to master. You have to get in front of decision makers, you have to say the right thing when you're there, and thirdly, you need to feel okay when you're doing it or it won't come across right. There's only these three. Which of these three do you feel most comfortable with? And which of these three do you struggle with? And using the word only in a small number, you can break anything down at all. So something as complicated as communication, you can say there are only two things that matter. You say the right stuff and you write the right stuff. So verbal and written are the only two things that matter. Which of those two do you think you'd like to focus on first to improve? Um, or you might go and speak to um, a group of leaders and say, with leadership, there's only two things that matter. Number one, getting the job done. Number two, making sure the people are okay. Which of those two do you... And it doesn't matter how you split it. So I could split communication, verbal and written, or I could split it face-to-face -face and virtual, or I could split it talking to a lot of people and talking to one. It doesn't matter what the split is, but using the word only and a small number and then splitting things down means you're then able to guide the discussion in a certain way. Sometimes uh, when people are doing what they do, uh, sometimes when people are explaining what they do, they use jargon. Uh, how can uh, we teach people to stop using jargon uh, when they are explain when they're trying to get their message across? Yeah. I, I think one of the best ways to avoid jargon is to come up with your own terminology. It's because when you're first of your kind, you know people are intrigued. They haven't heard it before, so it's not trite or cliche. You know, as as uh, Hollywood producer Samuel Goldwyn said, avoid cliches like the plague, right? So here's, a, here's one way to come up with something that is so new and fresh, it's not jargon because it's, it's not an eye roller. It's uh, the first time I spoke on uh, dealing with difficult people without becoming one yourself, that's what I called it. Now that's a pretty good title. It, it, when you put it in a beat, you make it easy to repeat. But see, we don't want to be one of many. We want to be one of a kind. We don't want to use everyone else's generic language or their jargon because we'll blend in instead of break out. I was very lucky because at that first program, at our first break, there was a gentleman in the front row. He didn't even get up to go get a cup of coffee or get some fresh air. He just sat there gazing off into space. And I'm kind of curious. I went over and said, what are you thinking? He said, Sam, he said, I'm a real estate broker. He said, I deal with some very demanding and arrogant people. They seem to think they can treat me any way they want to. I'm tired of it. He said, I thought you were going to teach us some zingers to fire back at people and put them in their place. He said, that's not what this is about, is it? And I said, no. And he was the one who said, I'm a student of martial arts. He said, I've studied karate, taekwondo, judo. He said, what you're talking about is like a verbal form of kung fu, isn't it? Light bulb, you're right. It's kind of like a tongue fu. Eureka, the perfect name. The best way to avoid jargon and to create a niche and corner a niche is to coin your own name. Because when you can coin your own name, you go to the head of the class, you can trademark it. Now you have a, an enterprise that can go global, all because you're not generic, you're not using jargon. You're creating a first of its kind word that you own in the public's mind. Andy, you've done, uh, I, I guess, something, if not the same, then similar in terms of developing a theme in your book, Deadly Effects, Mobile Effects, and you're getting terms that are associated with you. Is that what you're trying to achieve with that as well? Um, I, I guess so. It's more of a, um, it's a pleasant bonus, I think, um, of, of the way I describe things, Andy. The, the thing I'm always thinking is, what is the simplest way I can explain this so people latch onto it straight away? And what I found was, say, when I came up with the idea of afters, was that people, they offer the, the bonuses, they associate that with me now. Oh, he's the afters guy. 
Um, but the reason I came up with it was because I carried on coming up against people or, or meeting people who didn't understand how to explain benefits properly. So they would say, the benefits of working with us is we have market-leading advice. And you go, no, that's a feature because you're describing yourself. A benefit happens after you've given your advice. Um, and so it was this future focus that, that I realized that the word people often use, benefit, was making people do the wrong thing. It's like when you see a unique selling point. People know that unique is good, so they focus on their own uniqueness and they forget to talk about the customer. So I thought, I need another way to describe it. So certainly that was one of the one of the reasons that I did it. Yes, it differentiates me, but also it explains things in a way that people can act on. Um, the other thing that I find is when you're looking to um, uh, people use jargon, you can only really tell you're using jargon if you get feedback from someone. They say with communication, there are two things, both beginning with I. One is your intention, so what you intend to happen, and the other one is the impact, which is how people receive it. So I might say, my company was founded in 1922, and my intention is to give gravitas and history and elegance and poise and stability, but the impact is, you just think, so you're old and out of date and I'm paying for someone who's been around for 90 years and isn't very trendy. Um, and so the intention and the impact, the only way you can tell if you're too jargon-filled is to ask someone to get some feedback. So let's say when you've created a presentation or a piece of marketing, take out one of your customers for lunch, maybe go and show it to one of your business contacts who you trust and say, could you just have a look at this? Does this feel jargon filled to you? Because the thing is, what we don't realize it's jargon half the time, and unless somebody gives us that feedback and tells us the impact we're having, we just don't know and we can miss that beat. I... I um you know, I give similar advice, and I think that simplification is the most important thing. So I, I always recommend what I call the 10-year-old test, which is if you explain the message you want to get across to a 10-year-old, and, and I always suggest it's not any random 10-year-old, but one you know, um, but you, you, suggest, you, you, you explain it to a 10-year-old and get them to repeat it back to you in their own words. Because my contention is that people who are not in your uh, stream of business, they're not in your area of business, that's about the, the right age for their attention span, for their interest. So if you can put it into those simple terms, and, and uh, it can be repeated back to you, and it doesn't have to be a 10-year-old, it can be someone else, but from, uh, someone who doesn't understand your business, unless you're just trying to get your message across to your peers. Um, explain yeah, it to someone. Sorry, I'm just... Sure. Go on, sorry. I was just going to say, get them to explain it back to you, and see how close to the mark they are then you'll know if you're using too much jargon or not. Yeah, it's a great call, and I was going to add to that. One of my um, coaching clients recently, he's had feedback that he gives, he uses too much jargon, and um, you know that if you like, he would fail the ten-year-old test. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the eyebrows would be furrowed, Sam. They weren't coming up for anyone with this guy. And he said, "I just use jargon too much. What would your advice be?" Um, and I said to him, "Well." Um, how old are you? And he said, well, I'm 43. And I said, um, tell me a bit about your life. And he told me about his life. And he told me that he had this very important role in this very important company. And he talks about his children. He talks about his hobbies. And I said, listen, I'm hearing all this. You sound like a really mature, sensible adult. Is that fair? And he says, well, yes, it is. And I said, well, stop using jargon then. You know, you have the ability to stop this. Um, just don't do it. You know, if you think you might be doing it, then um, go back and ask yourself, why do I do it? How can you improve your preparation to get rid of it? Nobody intends to be full of jargon. All of us on this call, anybody listening will think jargon is a bad thing. But obviously, lots of people use it or we wouldn't be discussing this now. So get feedback. But remember, we can break our habits. We can change how we describe things. I love this 10-year-old test idea. What a great idea that is. Well, the thing is, we don't know always when we're using jargon. So just a simple example, this is the Global Networking Show. How many uh, people interested in IT and technology tune in thinking, well, I'm going to learn about how to connect computers together? Networking is jargon, and in different, uh, in different applications, uh, in different industries, it's applied different ways. So everyday words to you and me 
our jargon, elevator pitches, which we haven't touched on today. But elevator pitch is jargon. You wouldn't believe how many of my audiences have never come across the expression before. Um, so there's always jargon in what we do, and that 10-year-old test clears it out and helps us understand exactly what it is that we're so used to, we don't know we're saying it. But to other people, it's, it's double dutch. We only have a few more minutes, and uh, I'd love to have, I have one last question I think would be great to, to talk about, and that is, um, to Andy and Sam, what are some of the biggest communication fails you've ever seen or experienced? Communication fail. It's, well, it's, it is interesting because it piggybacks on what the conversation is, is that I, in a way, think that none of us should ever again give an elevator speech. Who likes to listen to a speech, right? So here is, I think, what we can do to reframe that to connect with people. And it's, uh, so here's a quick example that gives a technique. Um, I was speaking at an IT conference, and a guy came up to me in advance, and this was actually in um, uh, Dublin, Ireland, for a big YPO meeting. He said, Sam, I'm going to admit to you something I never tell anyone. He said, I'm an introvert. He said, I fly, I fly around the world to these conferences. I hide out in my hotel room. He said, because I hate chit-chat, small talk, plus I can never introduce myself in a way that people understand what I do. So I asked him, what do you do that we can see, that we can smell, that we can taste, that we can touch? And he said, why is that important? I said, most of us try and explain electricity. You know, like Andy's saying, no, don't explain electricity. Explain the after of how people experience or benefit from electricity. So he's talking about financial, software, credit cards. And finally, my light bulb went off. I said, oh, I said do you make the software? that makes it safe for us to buy things online? He said, yes. I said, don't say that. I said, he said, don't say that. I said, if someone says, what do you do? And you say, I make the software that makes it safe for you to buy stuff online. What will they say? Oh, it's the end of the conversation. We don't want to end the conversation. We want to kickstart the question. So I said, turn it into a power three. Do you know anyone, could be yourself, a friend, or family member, who buys anything online? I said, you want to stack the deck that there's a connection there? He said, sure. I said, what are the three most popular online retailers right now? He said, Amazon, Travelocity, and eBay. I said, so do you know anyone? Could be yourself, a friend, family member who buys stuff online, like on eBay, Amazon, Travelocity. They may say, I hate that stuff, but my wife is on Amazon all the time. Now you just link what you do to what they said. Oh, well, I make the stuff that helps your wife buy stuff on Amazon. Ah, oh, the eyebrows go up. He started getting misty-eyed. I said, what? He said, I can finally explain to my 8-year-old son what I do in a way he gets it. So it passes not only the 10-year-old test, the 8-year-old test, too. Excellent. Well, we're making even more progress there. Andy, how about you? What's the biggest uh, fail you see in communication? Um, the big biggest fails in the biggest error um, would be people not asking enough questions up front so they say irrelevant stuff. Um, so this could be anything. So if you're sending a document to a customer, a, a, a hardly anybody says to the customer, I don't want to bore you with irrelevant information, so do you mind if I just check what you want me to write in this? They just go to the office and spend ages writing the document, which contains stuff that people don't want to see. So people don't ask enough questions. A couple of good examples I've seen. Um, probably one that really stands in my mind was there was um, an organization who is a big global PR outfit, and they wanted to do the PR for one of the global um, G20 summit leaders of the world coming together. Um, and they put a pitch together, and their strongest selling point they had was we are brilliant at long-lasting relationships. So we work with this blue chip company and have done for 20 years. We work with this government agency and have done for 20 years. We work with this country and have done for 15 years. And, work. and they went on and on and on. And this was going all right. <laughs> and then the customer said, but the G20 summit only lasts a weekend. And that, I thought, was perfect encapsulation of how you can get communication wrong. You're so busy thinking our message is we build long-term relationships you forget the fact it was only a three-day event and someone wants you to be able to be brilliant for three days. So always ask questions. Always find out what the other person wants. Focus on that. Bring them value. Teach them stuff. And make sure they know where to go for more if they want it. 
and you brought us a nice full circle there because you started out by by talking about other people's perspective and understanding that and, and your lesson there is curb your enthusiasm uh, you know don't you know you, we're all enthusiastic about we offer or about what we offer or we should be but we have to dampen that initially so that we can find out what the other person's perspective is by asking them questions doing our research and then we get to be able to deliver the message that is right for them and that resonates with them. So it's a nice full circle there. Before we finish off, we have one last um, last question that Inga's going to ask us, and I think this could be a really nice way to finish with a one-line answer from all four of us. So Inga, would you like to ask the question, and maybe Andy, you could come in first of all with the first answer. Great. So it's a question from Jeremy, and he asks, how else would you describe uh, networking to a 10-year-old? Uh, oh, great question. Um, networking to a 10-year-old, I would say, it's talking to other people so you both get something out of it. Okay, Sam. Great, great question. 10-year-old, it's meeting people and connecting over things you both care about, whether that's soccer or whether that's um, uh, this movie you just saw or whether it's uh, that you both love your dog. And Ivan? Oh, the process of uh, developing relationships to increase business or, or enhance your knowledge. Okay, and I, my answer would be, I would say it's sharing. I would say it's making lots of friends and if one of your friends has more sweets than another one and another friend has more toys than another one, you share them out so that you all get the benefit of what everyone else has got. So I hope, Jeremy, that we, we, we answered your question there. Um, I'm, and you know, if anyone has any other definitions um, of networking for 10 year olds, we'd love to see them. Post them up on the Facebook page on the Google Hangout. Um, don't forget also to, to visit uh, globalnetworkingshow.com. Uh, this show will be available as a podcast if you want to listen again on the move. I'll be uploading that to iTunes straight after the show, so it should be there by hopefully tomorrow morning, if not before. Um, and tune in, we'll, we'll have more information on next month's show very soon indeed. And in the meantime, don't forget that you can revisit the discussion on Google+, Plus, on YouTube, and you can subscribe to the podcast via iTunes. And, of course, all of our shows can be found at globalnetworkingshow.com. That's globalnetworkingshow.com. So have a great weekend coming up. Uh, enjoy the rest of your stay in Paris, Ivan. Uh, thank you very much, Andy, for joining us from the delights of Liverpool. Uh, and Sam, where where are you based today? We didn't ask you at the beginning. I am on a lake outside of Washington D.C. Sounds lovely. I, well, you're, you're doing very well not to fall into it. So <laughs> enjoy yourself there. Sounds great. Inga, thank you very much for your contribution, and thank you for your, for joining us and for your questions. We'll see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.